Hello, everybody. We're going to start tonight's event. I am Munir Kumayan from the Department of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Liz Cottrell. Liz comes to us from the Smithsonian Institution, where she's the curator and in the Department of Mineral Sciences. Now, in addition to being curator, Liz is also the director of the Global Vol Vol Volcanism Program at the Smithsonian Institution, and they collect all the information on volcanic eruptions that are occurring around the world and have one of the biggest databases of volcano materials. Liz herself is an expert on volcanoes as well as on the deep interior of the Earth. This event is brought to you by the National Science Foundation's Geophysics Program. They have a distinguished lecturer program, and this is the distinguished lecturer on tour for, the next, for this year and next year. The program is also brought to you by the Tallahassee Scientific Society, the Big Bend Leon Association of Science Teachers, and the Department of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. So please join me in welcoming Liz, who will speak on volcanoes, windows to the deep. Liz? Thank you. Thank you, Munir. Is this? Yep. Uh, it's awfully big echo there. So if anyone's having trouble hearing me, just raise your hand. What a fantastic crowd. Thank you so much for coming out on a Monday night uh, to hear about volcanoes. That's just absolutely fantastic in my mind. Um, OK, and I want to thank, just start out by thanking uh, the National Science Foundation uh, and Florida State for sponsoring me to come here. And it's uh, such a wonderful venue. All right, uh, what we're looking at here is a volcano. This is Yasur Volcano in Vanuatu. And this is one of those volcanoes that just keeps going and going and erupting all the time. It's erupting right now. So one of the things I want to tell you guys about tonight is that volcanoes are erupting all the time, even when it's not in the news media, even when you don't hear about it in the news, even when it's not delaying your flight. Volcanoes are erupting, and I just want to give you a little tour of the world so we can see some volcanic activity. And I want to start my talk with the only <laughs> test question at the end of the talk. The most important thing I want to convey to you tonight is that volcanoes erupt rock and gas. And this became my mission uh, a couple of years ago. How many, do we have uh, children in the audience? Raise your hands, wave your arms. Okay, well there's this, there are these books, okay? Books about volcanoes. And my daughter, I have a daughter who's six years old and she brought home a book about volcanoes because of course she was gonna do her class project on volcanoes. Uh, I guess uh, not interested in other things from what her mom studies. And the, we opened the book to read and it said, the opening question was, what emits smoke and burns like fire? Not volcanoes. <laughs> there is no smoke coming out of volcanoes. And so while you look at these images, and I see people walking through the halls of the Smithsonian, and they look at the pictures we have, and they say, look at all that smoke coming out, OK? But nothing is on fire inside of volcanoes. Nothing is burning. And there is no smoke. What you're looking at is pulverized rock, volcanic ash. It has nothing in common with fireplace ash that is a burnt organic matter. There's nothing organic here. This is inorganic rock. It's glass. It's sharp. And what you're looking at here is full of giant boulders. And you're, you're looking from a distance. But when this stuff hits you in the face, it's not like you're not going to cough, OK? It's going to blow you away and cut your face to ribbons because it's sharp rock. And what is propelling this out of these volcanoes is gas, volcanic gas. Does anyone, any, raise your hand if you remember Mount St. Helens in 1980. That's a, yeah, all right. You know, sometimes when you're teaching undergraduates now, and, and then so I realized I was old when someone raised their hand and said, we weren't born in 1980. <laughs> so that was a horrible experience for me. Um, but I, that's the first volcanic eruption that I remember. And it came across the entire United States, the ash from that event, a, a fantastic event that rejuvenated volcano science in the United States and around the world. So this is a close-up of ash. You can see uh, a scale bar. Now, the laser pointer is not the world's finest right here. So yeah, you can't really see it up there. Oh, who? someone has a laser pointer? 
That's not me doing that. Don't. My laser pointer is red, OK? So if it's not a red laser pointer, it's not me. So that scale bar up there is 30 microns, and that's about the width of a human hair. OK, your hairs on your head are about 30 microns across. So you can see all those um, crevices, and those are bubble cavities, the gas of this volcano pushing the rock out into the world. And here, hold, held in someone's hand, is pulverized volcanic ash that actually, when it's pulverized fine enough, feels um, quite soft and smooth. OK, but the larger particle fractions, it is glass after all, volcanic glass. And it's sharp like glass. And you can see here um, the face of a little boy in Indonesia, where volcanic ash is a matter of everyday life. Now, pumice is volcanic rock. OK, it's glass and it's sharp. And that's why you can use it to remove calluses. It's literally cutting away the dead skin with a million little sharp little glass shards. And in fact, many of you, anyone have pumice in their home in the bathroom? OK, well, you have volcanic rock in your bathroom because pumice is uh, typically not synthetic. OK, it really is quarried from volcanoes. So you have a little bit of a volcano, I don't know which volcano, in your bath. And so think about that next time. That was once deep in the earth. And the pumice in your bathroom actually carries messages, just like the rocks that I study in my lab, about the deep earth. It contains information about the gases coming out of that volcano and the chemistry of that volcano. A whole new bath experience for you. <laughs> so the rock and gas coming out of volcanoes is hazardous. So who remembers the 2010 eruption of Eyjafjallajökull? In Iceland, OK, exactly. This was a major uh, volcanic eruption, not large in size, as we will soon see, but hazardous and disruptive because it grounded air traffic across the Atlantic Ocean. And this is an example of how volcanic eruptions can have both local and international effects. Locally, these Icelandic horses are obviously fleeing the eruption um, for the same reasons you would run away, because you don't want to be killed. And locally, the volcanic gases, such as sulfur, can make local acid rain. Okay, And the, the gas itself could, uh, is asphyxiating. Okay? So you can die of suffocation in these roiling plumes of gas and rock. This is, a, uh, appropriately, a NASA image. In the visible light, this is like what you would see if you were in space looking down. We're looking at the southern tip of Iceland. And you can see clouds all around. And coming off the bottom here, that's my red laser pointer, is the ash coming off of the volcano and out across the water here. And um, this is the same eruption pushing up through the clouds. OK, and you can see why this might be a hazard to local air traffic. And this was actually a, a personal uh, eruption for me. I had just become that month the director of the Global Volcanism Program and uh, went from zero to my phone ringing off the hook um, for a couple of months there. So really exciting times. And uh, that, that, that's going to come up a little later in the lecture. I think what's important about this event, it, it was a big media event. Okay. Nobody died in this event, right? but it cost the airline industry billions. People were stranded in Europe on their vacations, on business, halted Atlant uh, transatlantic air travel. Here's up close and personal, people with volcanoes. I don't know, this was not as major of a news event, but this is last September 2014, the Antakasan eruption in Japan. Um, an example, in Japan, there are many buildings, shrines located at the summits of volcanoes. And hiking up to the, to the rims of volcanoes is a um, common recreational pursuit. And this eruption happened when a lot of people were up at the summit. Uh, and you can see uh, these buildings were you know, a day earlier uh, selling trinkets and tea and food. And now you can see they're completely blanketed in this thick volcanic ash that is ground up rock, not smoke. So where are these volcanoes? How do they affect us as people? Um, this is a, an image I, I put together with data from the Global Volcanism Program. And what you're looking at here is a triangle for every volcano. And you can see 
Well, that's not true. You're looking at a triangle for all the volcanoes on land, okay? And uh, those are the ones that we can see. Those are the ones that the Global Volcanism Program, for the most part, tracks. And you can see they're not arranged randomly around the planet. They're located around the ring of fire. And we call it the ring of fire, I think, just to confuse you, because remember, there's no fire. Nothing is burning in a volcanic <laughs> eruption. But it's called the ring of fire here, this, uh, the ring around the Pacific Ocean, west coast of South America, Central America, up through the western United States. You know, the United States has more volcanoes than any other country on the planet. And they're all out here in the Aleutians, where nobody lives. So these triangles are color-coded by the log of the population within 30, a 30-kilometer 30 radius of the volcano. So does anyone want to tell me where are the danger zones in the world for volcanoes? Where are people living in harm's way? Indonesia, Indonesia Italy. right? Italy, yep, yeah, in Italy, Indonesia. Hawaii. Yeah, yep. Yeah. These are all all great answers. But on the test, if you took art history, right, and you never went to class, and it was the art history test, and then what was the answer, and you said, oh, I have no idea, it's, you know, the Pantheon, right? If it's a volcano question and you don't know the answer, the answer is Indonesia. It's where all the volcanoes are, it's where all the activity is, it's where all the hazards are, um, people really living close to volcanoes and in, in daily threat from volcanoes. You can see uh, large population here in Indonesia. Also Central America is another real hot zone. And Africa. Africa has a lot of people living near to volcanoes. What I also want you to see on this slide are all these chains of seafloor volcanoes. The Mid-Ocean Ridge System is a system of thousands, if not millions, of volcanoes constantly erupting. So all along here on these chains of volcanoes, okay, coming down from Iceland all along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Here's, this is called, oh, sorry, it's because my pointer is the same as my, the East Pacific Rise, here's the Indian Ocean Rift, and here volcanoes are making new crust on our planet. If you were an alien visiting Earth, and you came in your spaceship and you looked at the Earth, the first thing you would notice is that we have this bimodal topography, meaning that we have high places and low places. We have ocean basins that are full of water. That's why you can't see the volcanoes. And high areas are continents. And the ocean basins are young. That's because these volcanoes are erupting all the time. The tectonic plates are splitting apart. And the ocean is being continually resurfaced here. And these plates are moving apart. And you can tell the direction the plate is moving because here's Hawaii. Here's the chain of Hawaiian islands off into the Pacific, um, down under the water. And that's the direction the plate is moving away from all these volcanoes here. And so we're constantly resurfacing our young ocean basins while we live up here on these old continents. And as these plates move apart, okay, they get waterlogged because the oceans are there. They get waterlogged. And when they get to the edge of a continent, the continent is like the sponge in your bathtub, okay? It floats up on the surface, and this ocean plate is dense and cold and heavy, okay? By the time it gets over to the edge here, for example, in the Western Pacific, all right? And it sinks down below the continent. And, oh, we're in Florida. <coughs> You're not icing your sidewalks here. You don't have snow and ice. But anyone from the north, maybe originally, lived in the north previously? Okay, you add salt to your driveway, right? Sa salt to your walk, and the salt melts the ice, okay? Water is to the rock of the earth as salt is to the ice on your driveway. Adding water to rock makes it melt. Adding water <coughs> makes the rock melt at a lower temperature. So everywhere around the ring of fire, this water in, these, in the tectonic plates, the ocean floor, is sinking da back down beneath the earth, and that water is being released into the deep earth and causing it to melt. And that's generating all the volcanoes around the ring of fire. And as we'll see, water, what goes down must come up. And we'll see that water again in a few slides. 
So up here are the Aleutians. This is an NSF Geoprism's focus site. That means the National Science Foundation, the community of scientists, has decided that this is a place we really want to study. And in this decade, a lot of scientists are focusing their attention, including myself, on the Aleutians. Okay? And you'll see all the triangles up there are black. That means nobody lives there. But there are lots of volcanoes there. And those, that's an example of this what's called subduction zone volcanism, where these, this old ocean plate is diving back down and creating volcanoes there. Now, while nobody is living there, no one is in immediate harm's way of these volcanoes erupting, they are a major threat to aviation. You can see here that they are located exactly, for example, on some of these great circle routes from San Francisco to anywhere in the east. They pass right over the Aleutians. And as we saw in that picture from Ea in Iceland, the volcanic ash goes right up into the stratosphere at times in an eruption that is large enough, or at least energetic enough, to do so. And ash brings down planes. It's because it's rock. It's not smoke. It's not smoke from a fire, it's rock. And it gets into the jet turbines, and the heat makes that, that rock melt again, and it seizes, seizes the engines. And we saw this, whoa, saw this spectacularly in 89, um, when a plane on a great circle route was brought down by an eruption in the Aleutians, all engines out. So that's one of the reasons we want to keep track of these volcanoes. I mean, here is a small eruption. Okay, this is a small eruption um, in Russia. And this picture, I love that we're in the Challenger Theater. This is so much fun. This picture was taken by an astronaut out the window of the space shuttle, just with a camera, out, out the window. Oh, look at that. That's not, that wasn't happening a minute ago. And you can see, really, this gives you a really great perspective on how high these ash clouds can punch up from the surface of our planet up into the stratosphere big hazard for planes. So I just said that that was a small eruption. On an order of magnitude scale, that was a three. Okay, that was the eruption here on the left. AF Latioka was a four, and Mount St. Helens was a five. Okay, and they all look kind of big or similar maybe in these photos, but they were enormously different in size and scale, because this is a logarithmic scale, kind of like earth, well, exactly like earthquakes. Ea, for example, if you were living in Iceland, this is like going to the drive-in movies, right? These are cars, I don't know if you can see with the lighting here, but these are cars like pulled up to watch the eruption. You know, honey, and what do you think tonight? Should we, you know, go see Wally or the volcano erupt? You know, these cars are pulled up and people are spectating at these eruptions. This was not a terribly enormous eruption. It's an order of magnitude scale. So if we look and we um, imagine Ea Flatiokut here as a four, Mount St. Helens was a five. Okay? So these are an order of magnitude scale. Okay? So a magnitude four is a hundred times bigger than a two. And the, what's called the volcanic explosivity index, okay, kind of like the Richter scale of volcanic eruptions, twos are happening all the time. Threes are happening often. Fives, not so much, okay? Fives are not happening very often at all. So we'll look at that now. What we're looking at now is a scale kind of about volcano size. And right here on the left, we've got the frequency. So I said twos are happening all the time, okay? They're happening, you know, 50 to 100 a year, all the time, volcanoes erupting. And those aren't the ones on the seafloor. Those are the ones that the Global Volcanism Program uh, tracks on land, okay? Then we have magnitude... And they, and they are not coming and they're not doing anything with uh, air travel. Here, here's the, the magnitudes that affect air travel and then climate, okay? So down here, threes. Suddenly we're in the range where we can affect uh, air travel because they're reaching the stratosphere. Ea was a three, so here's a picture of Ea. Redoubt, okay? The one uh, that brought down a uh, plane, three. Here's an interesting eruption. November of 2010, Merapi in Indonesia was a four. You can see the destruction from a VEI-4. This is volcanic ash covering all surface, surfaces. And this was a really important event for me personally because this was right, it, you know, Ea Flatioka happened in April of 2010. This was in November. Ea, nobody died. 
nobody died, okay? Everyone was fine. Yes, people were in, in, inconvenienced. You know, oh, I have to spend another day on the Mediterranean, okay? <laughs> but Merapi, people died. Hundreds of people died. People lost their homes. People lost their property. How many media inquiries did I get? None. My phone did not ring for the Merapi eruption, despite the horrible loss of life and property. Whereas, you know, something erupts where people are, you know, I'm getting all choked up. Anyway, that was a really interesting introduction to me, kind of the intersection of science and society, where we can have uh, such great media attention, uh, disproportionate, uh, perhaps, to the, the magnitude, in, in the literal magnitude, and then the, the human impact of volcanoes. Again, Mount St. Helens was a five. We're familiar with that one here in the United States. And then Pinatubo was a six. That was in 1991. People probably remember Pinatubo, many people in the room. And that's the, the, the last biggest eruption we've had, the last six we've had. Very successful evacuation. Uh, we are not able to predict volcanic eruptions, but we can forecast and look for warning signals that in this case allowed a very successful evacuation from such a large event. Okay, Krakatoa, 1883. This is not a picture of the eruption. We don't have a picture of the eruption. But this eruption was global in scope, okay? Uh, an eruption of a size 6, 7, these are global in scope. And a, we saw red sunsets across Europe, which inspired art. I mean, many people attribute a lot of the art that came out during this time to this eruption which put so much particulate in the air as to cause sunsets to be red all the way in Europe. Tambora, 1815. This is an eruption we're going to come back to. This was a very large eruption with uh, effects on climate, which we'll look at in just a second. Okay, so why do volcanoes erupt? I need a volunteer. Right there, black shirt. First hand up, he was like, hey, I was ready. You gotta come down here though. I don't always ask for a volunteer, but I put that in at the last minute. I was modifying my, Munir probably saw me, my host, modifying my slides at the very, very last minute because I thought I was going to get a lapel mic, but I've got this hand mic, so I don't have, look at, how am I going to do a demo? So, what's your name? Colton. Colton. Nice to meet you. I'm Liz. Can you hold this for me? Yeah. Thanks. So. What is the, what, how do volcanoes work, okay? Can I hold this again? Yeah. Just hold it up high so people can okay. see. This is a seltzer bottle, okay? We've all had drinks from seltzer bottles. What's dissolved in seltzer? Carbon dioxide, okay? Now, this is exactly analogous to a volcano. How a seltzer bottle works is, per, is a beautiful physical, physical analog for volcanic eruptions. So you might have in school, you can rest your arm. You might have in school, you know, or at home, gotten a volcano kit, right? And you make the volcano erupt, all right? That's not how volcanoes work at all. Those, volca that, those kits often work by a chemical reaction. And um, so Smithsonian makes a very popular kit. And so I want to encourage you to continue buying those kits. <laughs> but that's not how volcanoes work. I just had to check myself there. I was like, wait a minute. So volcanoes actually work. Uh, you can do a better demonstration at home, in your classrooms, and with your kids using a seltzer bottle, okay? So carbon dioxide is dissolved in there. It's bottled, you know, you say contents under pressure, okay? Bottled under pressure. Bottled in cold, high pressure conditions. We have the carbon dioxide is dissolved in the water just as carbon dioxide, the same gas, is dissolved in magma. Liquid hot magma. Carbon dioxide dissolved in both. Okay, and it looks innocuous because it's in here. It's got the lid on. We've got the lid on. Can you take the lid off yeah. quickly for me, as fast as you can? <laughs> okay, what do you see in there, Colton? I see. Hold it up so people. A bubbles. Bubbles. And a lot of water everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I hope you didn't get too wet. So there's a lot of bubbles, and this is exactly what happens when a volcano erupts. The pressure is released from the surface. That's what happened at Mount St. Helens. There was a landslide, 
and the land side removed the overburden, lowered the pressure on the magma, and just the same way, the carbon dioxide, okay, its solubility in the magma is lower under low pressure conditions, just like the solubility of carbon dioxide in water is lower under lower pressures. That's why it's bottled under pressure. And just like that magma, this is boiling. The seltzer water is boiling, okay? We're nucleating bubbles and we're taking something from a dissolved state and we're boiling the CO2 off. Now, when that CO2 nucleates in bubbles because the solubility has fallen, because the pressure has changed, just like in a volcano, those bubbles are buoyant. They're less dense, okay? So pumice, and I have lots of rocks here. I hope you come down and look at them afterwards. Pumice, just like the pumice in your bathtub, okay, floats in water because it's less dense. It's full of bubbles. Can you see the bubbles in here? Yeah. Okay. He's confirming bubbles, okay? And it's the bubbles that want to get out at the top of the volcano, and they rise buoyantly, and they buoyantly, and they want to escape so violently that the water comes along for the ride. And that's just like a volcano. The magma's along for the ride. The rock is along for the ride. It's the gas that wants to get out and takes the rock with it, takes the lava, the magma with it, which then turns to glass in the air. Thank you so much. You did such a wonderful job. You can give him a hand. It's okay. Oh, the cat. We should call it the Ring of Seltzer, that's right. That would be more appropriate. <laughs> okay, and so you can see this demo again online if you want at iTunes University. Okay, so what gases are coming out of volcanoes? We just said carbon dioxide, okay? But most of it is water, okay? Remember how I said that the, the ocean floor gets subducted down, you add water to the deep earth, melts the rock there, okay? And that water-rich, melted rock, okay, gets up into the magma chamber. So most of the gases, the volcano breath, the breath of our earth, you know, when volcanoes erupt, it's like the earth respirating, breathing, lets us know that we're on a living planet, okay? And the breath of our earth is mostly water and carbon dioxide, just like you and me, okay? And it's probably not a coincidence either. And sulfur dioxide and other. Here's a bit of what the other is down at the bottom here, but you can see most of it is water. CO2 is a lot of it. Sulfur is really interesting because sulfur, we can see with, when we put on special eyeglasses, okay? When we're looking on the ultraviolet, we can see SO2. So here's a visible photograph, okay, of a little volcanic plume here on the right. And then the image on the left is an image taken with an SO2 camera, with a UV camera. We can see the plume in the image, and we're actually imaging the sulfur dioxide that's coming out of the volcano, so we can track the plume that way. And this is a, a great new technology coming online that's helping scientists to better understand the gases coming out of volcanoes. Here is Hawaii. Now, instead of with an SO2 camera, I'm looking from space. Okay, I'm using the same kind of glasses. Right? I'm looking in the UV. I'm looking at this sulfur dioxide plume around Hawaii. Now, in Hawaii, uh, they call it VOG, volcanic smog. And it acts just like smog in Los Angeles. You know, it decreases visibility. It's a health hazard. And here we are seeing it from space. Now, what about that volcano breath? And uh, what, what, uh, we're going to come back to Tambora, OK? Climate change. Raise your hand or just shout out, do volcanic eruptions, based on everything I've just told you about, the volcano breath, volcanic eruptions make the Earth warmer or cooler? Warmer for the CO2, cooler for the particulate matter. Wow. Very good. Very, very good. He said, warmer for the CO2, cooler for the particulate matter. And yeah, very well said. And that is, um, that is perfectly correct. The warmer for the CO2, you know, volcanic gas emissions uh, are insignificant relative to anthropogenic 
CO2 emissions. In fact, there's a really nice uh, metric, the anthropogenic multiplier factor. Okay, people have uh, an effect on an annual basis about 150 times right now all the volcanoes in the world in terms of how much CO2 we put out. Okay, but on short time scales, the effect of volcanic eruptions is to cool the planet, and that's because sulfur aerosols okay, absorb heat from the sun and also block radiation. So we're cooling the climate when we have an eruption and that cooling effect can last um, years. Okay, and so here we have France, we have Europe in 1815, the summer of 1816 uh, was the summer when there was no summer. We had massive crop failure, we had famine in Europe. And where is Tambora? That's, you guys are quick learners, yeah. Um, so you have uh, crop failure, famine, it was snowing, the canals were frozen, okay, in August. It was, it, was, it was winter in July in Europe because of this eruption. On the other side of the world, CO2. I can't show you a picture of CO2 from space, or actually I'm about to, but I couldn't about a year ago because we had no way to look at CO2 because you may be familiar, this seems like a really highly educated audience, really uh, familiar with the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere. This is the CO2 trend. We've surpassed 400 parts per million. This is anthropogenic, people-made CO2. And it's so high, okay, compared to what it was even a few decades ago that it's got such high background, we can't see the volcanoes anymore. Or since we've had the technology to look at volcanoes with satellites from space, it has always been too high. The background is too high. So it's very difficult to image CO2 from volcanoes from space, even though it's a major gas. So the sulfur is a tiny amount, but we can see it easily. The CO2 is a major amount, but we can't see it at all. So it's very hard to quantify the amount of CO2 coming out of volcanoes. This is Skiamaki, a satellite that sadly stopped communicating with us in, in 2012. All right. And this satellite, it's a UV satellite, and like any satellite, it's not built for looking at volcanoes because that would be too much to spend on volcanoes, but vol volcanologists can use it to their advantage to look at volcanoes. And I'm going to come back to the Aleutians again. Okay, in 2008, Kasatochi erupted in 2008, and that's way out here. So um, this is really far out in the middle of nowhere, and it took, you can see, the eruption was on August 7th, and someone went and looked. <laughs> a few weeks later, a boat went by, took a picture. Oh, looks like that blew up right there. And this eruption was about a magnitude three or four, and this is a map of the sulfur that came out of that eruption, okay, about a week after the eruption, and you can see that the SO2, here's Kasatochi way over on the left. You can't see my laser pointer, but there's a big red arrow. It's way out there. Now the sulfur is all the way over here. It's spread across North America. We can see it really well from space, okay, because of the wavelength uh, that SO2 absorbs in. Now, uh, someone working in my group, a very smart young man by the name of Christoph Popp, said, well, if we can see the SO2 so well, why don't we use the SO2 to tell us where the plume is, tell us where in North America the volcanic plume is, and then we'll assign all those pixels that the satellite's looking at as the plume pixels. So where we see SO2, we know the plume was here. And then we'll compare the CO2 in those predefined pixels and compare it to the background, okay? And that's what he did, he set a threshold. And what you're looking at here, I believe is the first map of carbon dioxide as seen from space from that eruption, allowing us to quantify the carbon dioxide released from this eruption. And what we find um, in this is that it's about 50 teragrams of CO2 from this small eruption, a magnitude three or four eruption. Now you might be like, oh no, 50 teragrams. But 50 teragrams is about the same amount of CO2 that New York City puts out every single day. 
Okay, so it's just another example of even a large or uh, eruption that you would recognize as large um, is not putting out a lot of CO2 relative to people. And this is just a forward model if we inject that CO2 into the atmosphere over Kasatochi, how it distributes itself across North America. And so this is, I'm going to um, take a, a break and have time for questions. Uh, I have another uh, bunch of images and slides about volcanoes in the ocean if people are interested, but I want to make sure that people have time to ask questions in case anyone has to leave. And I want to give you this resource of the Global Volcanism Program at uh, www.volcano.si.edu um, where you can get all the volcano data, you can download the data, you can ha watch all kinds of videos and learn all kinds of cool facts um, on this website. And I just want to take a, a pause and hear your questions and then if people want I can move on to talking about some volcanoes on the sea floor. But no one has any questions, I'll move on, but I'd love to hear your questions. Yeah, a uh, pink shirt. Um, so you said it was like dust and gas and stuff. So. Why do we see fire then if it's just gas and not fire? Great, Great question. question. What's, What's your name? Kia. Kia asks, if it's just gas and dust and rock, why do we see fire? And the thing is you're not seeing, so that first image, oh yeah, right there. Great, perfect. In that image, it looks like we're seeing fire. Now fire is something that's burning on fire. It's combustion. Combustion is when we're taking something, we're getting it hot. We're changing it chemically, okay, combustion. This is incandescence, which is that the rock, the melted rock, the lava, is so hot that you're seeing it, you're seeing that portion of the spectrum that's glowing red. So um, if you think about blowing glass, might be an experience if you've ever seen a glass blower, right? And they get the glass so hot that it glows red. That's what you're seeing, incandescence. It's not combustion. It's like a glowing with, with the, because of the temperature, because of black body radiation. Like the top of a stove is not on fire. That's great. Like a top of a stove or a glass blowing. It's not on fire, but it's glowing red hot. Other pink shirt. Could you back it up so that we can see that website long left right? Oh, sorry. Yep. At the top. Volcano.si.edu. Uh huh. Um, what value in, in that scale of two, four, five would Yellowstone be if it erupted? Uh, this is like my most dreaded question. <laughs> <laughs> she asks, what value on the magnitude scale would Yellowstone be if it erupted? So, Yellowstone is a super volcano. And um, I get a lot of movie requests to talk about super volcanoes, and I always shy away. Um, super volcanoes are a real thing, okay? Um, in, in Chile, um, in, in South America, Yellowstone, we've had a lot of examples of super eruptions. These would be eruptions of magnitude 8, probably. Uh, the, the, the magnitude scale goes up to a 9. We don't have any recorded 9s, okay? So um, it's an 8. And Yellowstone, if it happened, it wouldn't matter what the magnitude was because we'd be dead. <laughs> I mean, yellow, a, a Yellowstone scale eruption is uh, on the scale of the kind of eruptions that have global, dare I say, cataclysmic effects, mass extinctions. You would have ash veils across the entire United States. Um, massive climate change from an eruption like that. Bad news. Yeah. Yeah. What on the number scale would Vesuvius be? Oh, Vesuvius. Vesuvius is a great volcano to talk about. Um, now, Vesuvius could be any magnitude, really. I mean, Vesuvius could erupt, uh, is it two, a three, a four, five? Okay, Vesuvius is a really interesting volcano. It's a very periodic volcano. So um, Naples is built at the foot of Vesuvius. Vesuvius is the volcano from Pompeii, if you're familiar with Pompeii. 
all right? And that was about 2,000 years ago. We had the loss of an entire um, city there. The people of Naples today live in great danger. It's probably the world's most dangerous volcano in terms of its potential to erupt, erupt soon, and have a large population living right there. Um, it has erupted for the longest time every 50 years. Every 50 years, about. And it last erupted in 1944. So there's a lot of concern in terms of if volcanoes have a cycle, Vesuvius is overdue. And uh, I don't know what magnitude it would be. Vesuvius is capable, for sure, of producing a magnitude 4 eruption, for sure. Pink uh, coat up there. Oh, how does it have glass shards in if it looks like smoke? Great question. So the glass is just really, you know, you could, you should not do this at home, but your parents, <laughs> you could take glass, okay, and um, take a, a heavy rolling pin, like a, a marble rolling pin, and just smash it up and smash it up and smash it up. It'll eventually turn into a soft powder if you get the particle size small enough. But what happens in a volcanic eruption, you have that liquid magma, and it erupts, and it hits the air, and it cools so quickly that it makes a glass. It, it, it's what we call quenching. It's the atoms in the glass don't have time to arrange themselves into a crystal lattice. So you could take the same composition of magma and cool it slowly deep in the earth, and make granite. Does anyone have like granite countertops? They're probably not really granite. They're probably some other rock that the industry sells as granite. But good enough for government work. <laughs> Big crystals, okay? Granite, cooling slowly. And then if we took that same com composition, that same chemistry, and we froze it fast enough, it would make glass. And if you want to come down afterwards, when we, I have a great example of volcanic glass from the seafloor. Maybe you can see the shine on that. You can see this side is dull and this side is shiny. This side hit the ocean water, four degrees centigrade, and cooled so rapidly it made a shiny glass. And the underside cooled more slowly and made a finer size, a, a coarser size that's not shiny. Someone, uh, that up way back in the upper left, I've, I've Absolutely, volcanoes can cause tidal waves. They're called tsunami. And they are how the most lives are lost through volcanic eruptions, is through tsunamis. So um, a tsunami is essentially a standing wave, a displacement of water. And you see uh, the, the largest fatalities caused by volcanoes, up to 60,000 people estimated to have died in one eruption from a tsunami. We have tsunamis um, uh, in the Caribbean, and again, Indonesia, uh, all these places. And uh, yes, they are caused by volcanic eruptions. And there's places in the world, the, the loss of life is disproportionate to the volcanic activity. We now have around the Ring of Fire, the Ring of Seltzer, um, a tsunami warning system. Um, that broadcasts an alert, but even culturally, if you look, for example, in South America, people know when they feel an earthquake or there's a volcanic eruption happening to go uphill, okay, because there's that cultural training um, for tsunamis, and, and that's exactly right. They do cause, volcanoes do cause tidal waves. Uh, like, yeah, um, so there were, there were a bunch of, uh, so that's outside of the Holocene, it's my area of my expertise, is the, er the time since the end of the last ice age, but the Altiplano, uh, uh, the Altiplano region of the central volcanic zo zone in Chile, um, the name of the eruption, I know the name of the deposits, that's not going to help you, the Tara ignimbrites and things like that, but I can... You can email me, or you can email my program the question, and we'll get right back to you with that. Or you can look it up yourself. You can. No, you can. <laughs> um, in, in the database, if you were to search our database only, for example, for magnitude 8 eruptions, um, 
uh, we would take you to the large LAMEV, the large magnitude volcanic eruption database held by the University of Bristol, which we partner with, and they do all the older eruptions that are older than the Holocene. But I could get that for you. Mm -hmm. Do we, what's your name? Devin. Devin. Do we use volcanic ash for anything? Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, you mean beyond calluses? <laughs> it's like something more useful to me. Yes, volcanoes are our friends. I mean, that's the most amazing thing about volcanoes. So we're all living here on land, okay? The greatest benefit afforded humans by volcanoes is the creation of land, okay? Japan would not exist without volcanoes. It's all volcanoes. Indonesia, all volcanoes. Western US, all volcanoes. So we live on volcanoes. Okay, volcanoes have made the land you live on. So it's useful for that. Hawaii, right, a volcano that we live on. It's a state, okay, made by volcanoes. Volcanoes also re-fertilize the surface of the earth. Volcanic soils are the most fertile soils on the planet. We are taking we, have, we could have depleted soils, and volcanoes are bringing up nutrients from the deep earth, bringing up the phosphorus, the potassium, the calcium. And that's why people have lived on the flanks of volcanoes. In the tropics, where the high altitude of volcanoes, it's warm enough that the high altitude allows people to still live on the flanks of volcanoes, and they're farming those flanks because the soils are incredibly rich. Okay, so we get volcanic, we get fertile soils from volcanoes. And if that were not enough, your cell phone, anything like that, all the noble metals, and your wedding bands, anything, anything you have in your home is made by volcanoes essentially, all right? So we have the platinum ores, any kind of precious metal ores, um, uh, Iridium, anything is concentrated by fluids in the deep earth in these subduction zones, these oxidized fluids create, or you have massive volcanic, in, well, they're igneous intrusions, but still the same principle. You have massive intrusions of magma that create ores, that create precious metals, that make all the technology around us work. Oh, hold on, right here in the yellow, and then I'll go over there. And ask two questions. Uh, the, the, first, that was one. the first one is I was wondering if there's any research to try to harness the energy in volcanoes to produce mm -hmm. electricity and other uh, human needs. And the second question is I've read that the Chinese observe animals to predict uh, animal behavior to predict <sighs> earthquakes, and I'm wondering if they can do anything similar with volcanoes. So, Dizzy. Uh, I'll do the take the first question. So she asked about um, volcanoes, harnessing the energy of volcanoes. Yes, all the time. It's called the nation of Iceland. I mean, <laughs> all of Iceland's power is geothermal energy. Okay, that's why, I don't know why, why everything else is so expensive there, but energy is cheap, <laughs> right? Energy up the wazoo. Volcanic energy being used, they, don't, they don't essentially have no other power. And uh, the, the nation of Iceland is powered by geothermal energy. Um, other question, uh, animals uh, might be able to predict earthquakes, so can they predict volcanoes? Just not even touching that. Because I don't know about the animals predicting, I mean, I, I obviously have heard about animals predicting earthquakes, but that's a kind of, I don't want to wade in those waters. And as far as I know, no volcanic eruptions have been predicted by animals. But I'm sure if you Google that, you'll find something. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I was going to get up here. I can talk about Santorini. So my, I, I, I have, um, my, I am a volcanologist because of Santorini. When I was an undergraduate, I was a chemist. So if you're kids in the audience and you're thinking, I want to be a volcanologist, I was a chemistry major um, in college, and I was, you know, doing my thesis work and the test tubes and all that stuff. And I took a geology class about planetary geology from a man named Jim Head. And it was just blew my mind. And I went to the geology department and I said, I want to do my thesis work in this department, even though I'm a chemist. And I had a couple of false starts. And then I, I fell in with a guy named Mac Rutherford, who was studying Santorini. That was my, my first scientific research project. My first big one was Santorini. 
And um, I can talk about that. The magnitude 7 eruption of Santorini ended the Minoan civilization around the turn of the century, so early 1600s. Okay? Ended the Minoan civilization. It is the source of the myth of Atlantis, the lost city of Atlantis. There was a civilization, the Minoans, and they lived in the Mediterranean basin. The Santorini is located off of, uh, it's part of Greece, island Greece. Popular honeymoon destination. Uh, you can now, that it's completely blown, it's made a caldera. A caldera is the big pit left after a volcano has a, a climatic eruption, okay? And uh, the Minoan civil civilization was completely wiped out by that eruption. Um, and today, it makes a big horseshoe-like island, and you can, you can pull cruise ships. It's deep enough that cruise ships can pull right into the inside of the caldera. And when you're looking up at those cliffs, you see all the eruptions of this volcano, all the layers put out by this volcano right in the cliff face. Magnificent. I suggest going. Um, way up in the back left, <coughs> yeah, you. Can you, can you shout it out? What do volcanoes turn into after they erupt? They are still volcanoes. So that's a, that's a really, really good question. How do we define an active volcano? All right? Volcanoes, we define as active any volcano that has erupted, is known to have erupted, or is suspected to have erupted in the Holocene, which is the last 10,000 years. Okay, so even if a volcano hasn't erupted in 9,000 years, we still call it an active volcano. All right, so you look at a volcano, let's talk about Mount Rainier, for example. All right, there's a volcano that's right in the Seattle Tacoma metro area. All right, people have built their homes on pyroclastic flows that are only, you know, hundreds of years old. Okay, um, and uh, this is a. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a big deal. So volcanoes are still volcanoes even after they erupt. Yellowstone, still a volcano. Has Yellowstone Why, you can't just shout out. Raise your hand, man. <laughs> okay, back up there, and then I'll come down here. Okay, we have someone from Hawaii, and they have orange. So is it volcanic? I mean, it's d definitely volcanic because there's nothing on Hawaii that's not volcanic. So that's the easy answer. That's the easy answer for me. Why is it orange? Two possible reasons. One is that it's become oxidized, that the iron in the rock has been oxidized by being exposed to the reactive oxygen in the air and essentially has rusted the rock. The other option is bacteria. And essentially, a lot of times you see orange streams that can be um, bacteria, um, redox active bacteria if you have like um, uh, contamination, things like that. And now I'll take your question. Yeah, um, Yellowstone's last eruption was at least, I think, a half a million years ago, okay. so or more. It's sitting there, bubbling along peacefully, we hope, for a much longer while, but it's one of these days it's probably going to blow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that we can... Don't hold your breath for like a massive eruption from Yellowstone. I think it's safe to, it's safe to own property in Jackson. I think it's, you know. Safer than Seattle. Safer than Seattle, safer than Naples. Absolutely. I already got you. Way back row, and then you're next. Way back row, and then black shirt. Yep, you. Not you. You did the demo. The other the little boy with that is. Yeah, you. <laughs> 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 
It does. Ah, it is. Uh, he said, when a volcano erupts, why doesn't the mountain erupt, and why doesn't the, volcan the mountain melt? It is, it is, it is. So the, the, the volcano, the edifice, in a volcano, like a stratovolcano, if you could cut the volcano this way, you would see all the layers. So a great example, you can go online at this same website, okay? And if you go to the learn link and you look at some of the videos, there's a great example in Mexico, Pericatine, the volcano born in a cornfield. Literally, there was nothing there. There was a cornfield. And this volcano just, a volcano is a mountain made of rock from the inside of the earth. Okay? And it's been built up in layers until it makes a bigger and bigger volcano. And it's the melt from inside the earth coming out. Now, at the top, it's just not, when you build that edifice, those past flows are just not getting hot enough to melt. And you have essentially the volcanic neck or the conduit is sending the, this, the shooting gas and rock out the top. But beneath the volcano, it, it, is, it is melting. And the volcano and the mountain, in a sense, is erupting. I probably said something wrong then. <laughs> you said the water makes the rock melt, but the mm. water cools the magma. That's why Hawaii is there at all, so I just don't understand that. Great. She says, you said that water makes the rock melt, but then, then you also said that the you know, Hawaii is there because you got this glass from the, the hot lava hitting the ocean floor and cooling quickly. So how can it both melt rock and cool rock, cool the magma? Great question. So deep in the earth, okay, we have, I think one of the major, there are two major misconceptions in earth science, and one of which, okay, can't, we don't have the room that much longer. Um, one of the major misconceptions is that volcanoes put out smoke and fire, but it's rock and gas. And the other is that the inside of the earth is liquid. The inside of the earth is solid. We, ha we have a solid planet. It's solid rock. 70% of the volume of our planet is solid rock. Not just, a f not just the that we're standing on, but deep, deep down, it stays solid all the way 2,008, no, yeah, 2,883, thank God someone else is here. 2,883 kilometers all the way to the core mantle boundary, okay? The total radius of the Earth is 6,731 kilometers, okay? And if the microphone, if the microphone were the radius of the Earth, the solid part comes all the way down to about here, and that's solid silicate rock, all right? And then we have a liquid iron metal, iron nickel alloy core, and the liquid core is roiling about and convecting, and that creates the magnetic field. And then at the very, very center, kind of like the Tootsie Pop, the center, such high pressure that the, the liquid iron is solidified, again, due to the incredible pressure. So here's the thing that you have to get your head around. If we are all atoms in this room, all right, and we're compressed into this room. And so you're all sitting in these chairs, right? We've organized you that way, all right? Because that's how much we can pack you <laughs> into this room by organizing the chairs in rows and columns, okay? So you're all packed into this room, okay? We're, we're pressurized in here, okay? Then when, when, the, when this is all over and we're kicked out of the room in a few minutes. Okay, are we have this for another hour. Oh. But he said he only had a, no? I was misinformed. So I can keep answering questions, um, and I can do more slides. When we leave eventually, when I eventually <laughs> say it's time I must leave, we'll spread out, OK? And so when we're together, we're packed densely, and that's like a solid, OK? We're making a, I was like, where was I going with this? Making a solid. <laughs> when we leave, we're allowed to spread out and get loosey-goosey, and that's when we, we're liquefied, OK? So the release of pressure causes things to move from a solid to the liquid. And the reason it's so confusing is that, as people, our common experience with phase transition is water to ice, OK? As people, when we think about how uh, the same thing, water, you know, I put it in the freezer, it becomes ice, and ice floats. 
when you, when you cool water, when you freeze water, okay, it gets less dense, and that's why, why ice cubes float to the top of your glass or why ice on a pond is at the top. And when you, when you apply pressure to ice, if you squeeze two ice cubes together, they melt because the pressure causes the ice to melt. Nothing else works this way. Okay? No other substance works this I shouldn't say no other substance. I'm being taped after all. Almost no other substance works this way. And rocks, when you put pressure on them, like all other substances, they solidify. And when you release the pressure, they melt. It's called pressure release melting, in fact. And so the solid earth, okay, ready? Everyone listening, if you're eating your popcorn or you're falling asleep, wake up. The solid earth, even though it's solid, is convecting, it's moving. And if you think about um, like asphalt, okay, is solid, road material is solid. But if, or honey, honey. If you took a jar of honey and you put it in your freezer and you turned it upside down and you came back months later, don't do this to your mom, but if you were to do that months later, you would find that the honey was flowing very, very slowly because it had gotten cold. It had gotten really viscous. If you hit that frozen honey with a hammer, it would crack. The earth is just the same way. It flows on long time scales and is convecting, but on short time scales, energy can pass through it like earthquakes and it can behave brittily. So the earth is solid. You're getting back to the water question. And that solid, when you add water to it, it lowers the melting point just like any substance. So I'm searching now for a common analog to adding well, just like adding salt to, to water ice, okay? It, when you add an impurity to a substance, it lowers the melting point. So the water lowers the melting point of the solid rock. Now I've got liquid hot magma, and it's hot and it's molten. And now it come, it, the pressure continues to release. I get more and more melting, more and more melting. And then I erupt onto the seafloor or onto Hawaii, and the cold water freezes it solid again. So that's how water can both act to melt the rock and also to freeze it. Great question. So the earth is frozen honey? <laughs> the earth is like frozen honey. Yes. Yes, right there. Yep. Yep. Yep, yep, you. Several times in geologic history there's been massive, massive eruptions of earth and that they call the end of whole biological age. What Maybe. I don't know. Um, the really, when you talk about the really, really, really big eruptions, you're talking about things like Deccan traps and the Siberian traps, where somehow in a period of just millions, uh, thousands maybe even now with new dates, thousands of years, hundreds of cubic kilometers of magma outpoured on the surface of the Earth postulated now to have caused the 60 million year extinction, the extinction of the dinosaurs rather than a meteorite impact. Nobody knows how that works. How do you melt so, how do you how do you melt so much and create so much magma in such a short time span? What would the effects have been? This is an area of absolutely active research. There's an entire consortia of people uh, across the United States working on this very question right now. Very big question. I don't know. Oh, you, then you. The, uh, Angora, Angora, Caldera. Angora, Angora. No. Sorry. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> in Tanzania. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's located in Tanzania. You're not familiar with that? What, I can't, I. Angora. Okay. In okay. Tanzania. Are you familiar with the Caldera there? No, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm not familiar with all the feature names of Uh, that's a great question. How does a caldera get developed? Um, that's a topic of many research papers, and it's much better shown with figures than, I, it would be much easier to show with figures than with words, but essentially you're emptying out a magma chamber, and then you have, um, it's thought of to have roof collapse, blocks of the roof as the magma chamber enter, empties out, roof blocks collapse. Uh, and, and, that's, and that forms the caldera floor. You've essentially taken all the, the liquid rock from inside, you've taken it out, 
and you have collapse into the void space. I'm going to take one more question and then I'm going to let, I see people need to leave. I want to let people leave without feeling like they're being rude, so yeah? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, a great uh, geologist actually was you know, Charles Darwin, in fact. And a lot of what we understand about how the Earth works comes from the study of, of atolls. So you have a volcanic eruption. And then uh, if, I, if I went back to hey, Hawaii, remember that chain of islands going out from Hawaii, all right? What you have is a volcanic eruption that builds land, OK? And then Remember how I talked about new crust being formed at those mid-ocean ridge volcanoes, and it, it's resurfacing the planet, moving aside? That is thermal subsidence. So the plate, the, the tectonic plate, is sinking, cooling, and subsiding, causing the whole island to sink back down. So if there's no longer a source of heat making new volcanic rocks, eventually the plate subsides away under the water, and you can form an atoll also from the action of biology from corals, for example, constantly wanting to live near the light at a certain depth. So they are growing and growing as the land is sinking and sinking. And that's how you get some of these beautiful um, ringing coral atolls. Will Bora Bora sink eventually? Will it? Well, you, the yes, but the biology needs to keep up and keep those reefs near the surface. I'm going to stop here, but I, I, can, I can stick around, and I have uh, samples up here to look at, and I can show slides of going to look at volcanoes under the water, in the ocean, or anything, um, but I'm going to let everybody leave who needs to leave right now. Thank you very much. Great audience. Thank you. I'll make a few more formal remarks. Um, and anyone, yeah, people came up to look at this stuff. This is just a good example of uh, the solid part of our Earth. I forgot I had this sample. Someone else found it. Uh, the solid part of our Earth that hasn't melted, but that if it were to melt, would make volcanic rocks, would make this black basalt that you can see is full of bubbles here. And if, if you want to feel how heavy this is, it's extremely dense, right? And you can see how the, the gas bubbles are so buoyant and so energetic that they can hurl objects like this kilometers, actually, away. It's, ex it's extremely dense and he heavy if anyone wants to come up and look at it. So I'm just going to show a few more slides here about ocean floor volcanoes. Since, can we bring the lights down? Reed, my man Reed, in the box. Can you bring the lights down? Thank you. Um, sea going research. Okay, so back to the volcanoes on the, and, and I was just asked the question, which was a good lead into this about Iceland, which is this massive hunk of land, my little red laser pointer, up here. And you can see that Iceland sits right on this long chain of volcanoes that we call the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Okay? Hawaii is here on no ridge. It's in the middle of nothing. It's in the middle of the Pacific plate. And he said, why are there so many volcanoes in Iceland? What is going on there? Um, it's called a, a hot spot or mantle plume volcanism. And uh, let's see, I have this handheld mic. I'm going to use the microphone as a prop to do this. Imagine uh, that you have the, the, the mantle of the Earth, and it's the whole thickness here of the microphone. And down at the bottom, you've got the core. And there's some topography there. And you create uh, a plume, a thermal instability, kind of like a candle. I, it's not like a candle burning. I just gave a whole lecture about how it's not like a candle burning. But un unfortunately, geologists use the analogy of a candle burning. A hot plume of material that is geostationary. And geologists have known about these geostationary plumes for a long time. And now with satellites, we can really prove that they are stationary. Many of them are extremely stationary. These thermal plumes that come up. Now, the plate, the ocean plate, I told you, is moving across the seafloor. It's being generated, for example, at the East Pacific rise here. Okay, And the, 
the volcanoes are generating new land, new ocean floor, and it's moving across like this and it's getting older and thicker and then it gets subducted beneath Japan and Russia and all up here, okay? And here's Hawaii, and Hawaii is the best example of a plume that we have. You have Hawaii today, modern Hawaii, and you have a plume underneath, and as that plate comes across this stationary object, I just can't do this with the mic in my hand. Hold on. As the, you have the, uh, this hot thermal plume, and as the plate comes across it, you make Hawaii one, okay? And then the plate moves, okay? But the, this stays in the same position, so the plate has moved. These now don't have the, they don't have the heat underneath them, so they start to sink and subside out to the west. And the location, the location of the modern plume, okay, is here where Hawaii is today. This land out here used to be where Hawaii is today. These are all old volcanoes. So as the plate has moved across this single stationary hot spot, okay, it, it creates new, a new volcano here all the time. And soon this volcano itself will move off and away and a new volcano will form on the land that is now out here. In fact, it's happening already. A little volcano called Loihi is a new land, new island, new volcano off the southeast corner of Hawaii. And Iceland, okay, is a plume on top of a ridge. So it's like double whammy. The earth, the crust is splitting apart, and so you have all that pressure release melting. You're having the earth, as it, as it rises, it, the pressure goes down and you have melts generated. And then at the same time, you have a thermal anomaly from below that's giving extra heat. So that's why there's so many volcanoes and you have this enormous volcanic platform up here at Iceland. So those chains of volcanoes, this is now zooming in on that. Okay, you're over here in Florida on the left, all right? And out off the coast in the middle of, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean is this huge chain of volcanoes. Okay, these are all volcanoes along here. This is the axial ridge volcanoes all along here, creating new crust. So this is where we have what we what geologists call zero age crust. This crust is made geologically yesterday. And the crust out here is old because it's moving away. So new generation here all the time, moving apart, okay? So we know these volcanoes are there. We didn't know that, you know, the, the the revolution, the geological revolution happened much later than many other fields. And we think about the atomic revolution, biological revolution, okay, the discovery of DNA. The geological revolution is the most recent, okay. Even in the early 70s, we didn't get it, okay. We did not get the basic principles, we're not understood to science, of how the earth works. And that these volcanoes were out here and that the oceans were being resurfaced all the time in the plate tectonics. I mean, it had been noticed for a long time that, hey, Africa and South America, they kind of fit together, you know? But the idea that the rock was really moving apart um, was not well understood until the 70s. Um, and so these volcanoes out here, this is like a very common story. Uh, ships would, would go across the ocean and they'd ping, ping, you know? ping, and you would see this flat, flat, flat forever, flat um, ocean floor, and then suddenly a giant mountain, and these giant mountains were the mid-ocean ridge volcanoes along the middle, and uh, a woman named Marie Tharp, except um, her boss, Hazen, gets a lot of the credit, the, the guy, but it was her, uh, Marie Tharp at uh, Lamont Dirty Earth Observatory, who put all the ping pings together and as an artist started to draw these ridges, chains of volcanoes that must connect all the different topographic highs on the sea floor. And today even her artistic maps, her physiographic maps, very, very accurately predict the real topography that we know is there now from both satellites and from sending ships with side scan sonar, this is, these are sonar images that you're looking at here. 
and satellite. So this is a, a volcanic eruption underwater. This is the hot, liquid hot magma coming out, lava hitting the seafloor and instantly cooling, quenching, freezing to a glass, a disordered glass here on the seafloor. This is uh, West Mata. You can see great video footage of this online um, from Scripps, I believe. This is a boat that I was on for about three months called the RV Melville, again, a uh, ship out of Scripps. And I was on this ship in 2001 with about 20 other scientists and about the same number of crew, 20 crew members. And we were going um, to the uh, Pacific Ocean, south of the equator, to those ridges near the East Pacific Rise, near these chains of volcanoes. And the, uh, what I was saying earlier is that these volcanoes are erupting all the time. We don't see them. They're underwater. They're seafloor volcanoes. So how do we get them? Well, you go fishing. Essentially, you take a giant metal bucket, shown here, giant metal bucket. It's got teeth on it. It's kind of like if you took a front end loader and with the teeth on it and instead hung chain mail uh, down the bottom. And this is the back of the ship. This is me here, a younger me. And you throw it off the back and you pay out about 10,000 feet of crane cable. So if you can just imagine um, a mountain 10,000 feet high, think of your favorite, ten we're here in Florida. <laughs> think of somewhere else you've been with 10,000 foot high mountains and imagine that much cable being paid out to rest this bucket on the seafloor and then we literally drag it along the seafloor and reel it in, like going fishing, reel in the chain, the cable and the bag, it, ba the bag, the bucket there, drags and bumps along the seafloor and breaks off volcanic rocks so that when you reel it in, you hope that the bag is full of rocks, full of volcanic rocks. And indeed, this work goes on around the clock, in the middle of the night, it doesn't matter. I mean, your tax dollars at work, we're working all the time, uh, wherever the ship goes, dredging up volcanic rocks. And this is a big haul of volcanic rocks on the back deck of this ship. And here is me with my haul of, uh, this is I think my first dredge bringing up these uh, volcanic rocks from the seafloor. I'm very happy. You can see the shiny black crust and this beautiful, this is a pillow shape. They're called pillow basalts. Doesn't it look like a little pillow that you could go to sleep on at night? Except it's a rock. Um, but it's got this pillow shape, pillow basalt shape. This is the non-glassy, more slowly cooled interior. And this is the glass on the surface, this rapidly quenched glass, which is the, the bulk composition of the rock. Very useful in geochemistry. And sometimes we get a lot of rocks. And so these are all volcanic rocks that they all get uh, cataloged, documented, and uh, saved, okay, and brought back to, to institutions. It's extremely expensive to go to sea. Um, you know, minimal cost would be like $50,000 a day for a minimal operation to go out and, and get rocks like this. So they're very, very valuable to science. Uh, this is another dredge. So this is one dredge, and we got all this, and this was another one. And sometimes you dredge up things that aren't rocks, like sharks. So we nicknamed Dredge 11 sharks, um, because sometimes there are sharks in the dredge basket. And uh, even though this was a small haul of volcanic rocks, you can see they're really glassy and shiny. And if you're a geochemist, that's definitely what you want to see, because a lot of the research takes place on these glassy rinds. And sometimes we bring up stuff we don't know what it is. Okay, this was a, I don't know, looks like a shrimp. Um, but I'm not a biologist, so we just, you know, bio sample number one, right? We didn't, none of the geologists knew what it was. But we, we bring those back too. And this is just an interesting aside, is that um, a lot of what we know now about how life works and the origin of life comes originally from geology. It was geologists going to look at these volcanoes when they completely as a surprise to them, I think it was 1993, I remember this um, very well happening, um, these geologists came and found life, when they went down in a submersible, found life at these submarine volcanoes living in the complete 
absence of sunlight. No sunlight penetrates to these depths in the ocean. And some of these volcanoes were teeming with life, not just bacteria, but like giant crabs and tube worms and all kinds of practically, you know, macrofauna. Okay? And so now one of the major theories of the origin of life is that it might have originated from creatures living off of Earth's energy, the heat and the chemistry, the oxidation reduction reactions, uh, essentially colonizing the mid-ocean ridges with life. And not just little shrimps like that. Okay, so these all get sorted and, and cataloged. This is a picture of dredge number three um, from that event. Here's some of that rusty material. Okay, you can get rusting on the seafloor uh, due to the, the material meeting with our oxygen rich uh, ocean water. And this is a drawer, just one drawer among thousands at the Smithsonian Institution. It really is like Indiana Jones, it's, it's no lie. Each one of these, this is a drawer, and each one of these little boxes a couple inches across, and the, each one of these boxes, you see the little black spots? Each of those vials is full of a few chips from a different volcano on the ocean floor. And we have about 13,000 different samples of seafloor glasses in our drawers at the Smithsonian, <coughs> so that next time someone wants to study a rock from that location, from that volcano in a certain part of the world, we don't need to spend another, you know, millions of dollars to go out and get the rocks. Anyone, any um, person with a legitimate research question can check these rocks out, like a library, from the Smithsonian, take them, study them, and return them. And so I was just going to give you a quick peek um, on, on life on a ship. So the food's good. The fish is always fresh. And a lot of what we ate, you know, we were out, like I said, we went several months without seeing any land. And so let me tell you, when you are on the last head of cabbage on that ship, you know, that is like the last leaves of fresh vegetable you will eat and you savor that cabbage. I've never loved cabbage so much as I did on that ship. But the sushi's great. I mean, they would land. This fish is uh, called the wahoo. Wahoo! Reel these in, and they would fillet them right on the deck of this ship, and we just eat them raw. It was delicious. That's the captain on the right. Uh, staying in shape. I mean, you're out there. There's a really nice view. This is me on the um, uh, high-tech fitness equipment uh, located on the RV Melville. Uh, I, I, had a, I had to take a slide out since we're being taped, um, but there's a, there's a hot tub on the ship as well uh, that uh, was used the engine, the heat from the engine to heat the water, and it like all bubbled, it was great, um, on the deck of the ship. And so there uh, wasn't a lot of opportunity for recreation, but riding my bike I did a lot. And we were out over the holidays. We were out for Christmas, actually. So we had a cookie decorating party. You can see I'm really tan there after months at sea. No matter how much sunblock you put on, uh, you get tan. And these are the perennial activity of scientists going to sea at a dredge operation. These are styrofoam balls, OK, and styrofoam cups. Uh, here are the cups on the right, and that's a styrofoam ball. We decorate them with markers, give the lat long, the depth we're going to be over, make nice decorations on them, constellations. I mean, there's nothing else to look at, so people always drew scenes of like sunsets and constellations. And then they go in a bag, one of our, this is a, a, an onion bag, and you can see there's like a Christmas wreath in here and all kinds of styrofoam paraphernalia. And just like um, how volcanoes work, when you go down to the ocean floor, just like going down in the pool, you know, your ears hurt or pop, when you go down to the sea floor, that's why we have submarines um, and diving equipment, is that the pressure, if you imagine how much pressure you're under at the bottom of a deep pool, okay, now take that 10,000 feet, you know, kilometers of water, the pressure on the ocean floor is really, really high, and it's great for geochemistry. It's great for volcanologists because remember how we talked about volcanoes erupt gas? The pressure is so great on the ocean floor that that pressure holds some of the gas in. 
So a lot of what we know about the, the volatile elements, the water and the carbon dioxide that comes out of volcanoes, we know that from analyzing the glass because some of those gases are still dissolved in the, gla in the get glass. Okay, back to the styrofoam. You put the styrofoam in this bag and you send it down to the bottom of the ocean and all the air gets pushed out of the, 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 the structure of the styrofoam and shrinks it. You make little Christmas ornaments. So these are, these are full-size styrofoam cups. These are like, you know, Starbucks Grande or whatever that have shrunk down to the size of like they're like little thimbles and all the, the air has been, and that giant Christmas wreath is hanging right here that was like this big when it went in and they shrink down to these tiny little, little cups. This is one of the members of the crew. He had been at sea a lot over the holidays. It, was, it no longer held any magic for him. And um, I'm going to close my, what is this, it's like the encore or something, with a South Pacific sunset, beautiful out there. And uh, I hope uh, many of you, especially young people in the audience, will be inspired to go into research. And uh, again, I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation, Florida State University, Challenger Theater, and everyone for being such a great audience. Thanks for sticking around.